started? Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Can do I sound okay? <laughs> well, we're super excited to have Lake Flato with us this morning. We're going to jump in shortly, but first, I wanted to give a little background on the presenters we have with us. First, we have Jonathan Smith. His designs foster meaningful and lasting relationships between building occupants and the natural environment, demonstrating excellence in the art of building, the science of sustainability, and love for the natural landscape. Jonathan joined Lake Flato in 2005 with a background in large-scale urban mixed use and community developments. He has a strong passion for transformative projects that have an impact beyond their property lines through environmental sustainability, performance-based design, and response to climate. Recently, Jonathan was project architect on the LEED Platinum 180,000 square foot New Central Library in his hometown of Austin, Texas. In 2018, the Austin Central Library was named one of Time Magazine's world's greatest places. Our next presenter, Matt Wallace, is co-leader of the firm's Eco Conservation Studio, which fulfills his passion for championing projects that encourage environmental stewardship. He studied under Pritzker Prize laureate Glenn Murcott, who taught him the importance of sustainable practices. Since acquiring this philosophy, Matt has implemented it in a number of projects ranging in scale and locale from the northern landscapes of Montana and Illinois to the arid deserts of Arizona and Texas, all while respecting each region's climate and context. Matt's recent projects include the Briscoe Western Art Museum in San Antonio, Texas, and the pioneering Gulf Coast Research Laboratory, at the Marine Education Center in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. With that, I'll let Matt and Jonathan take it away. Great, thank you all for, for having us. We're super excited to be here. Um, so this is uh, the firm back when we could all be in one place at one time. This is our annual firm retreat, uh, Flake Leto. And uh, there is uh, there Matt and I uh, back when we could you know, be at be out in the woods together. So I think that what's really great about Lake Plato is it's a really amazing group of people. Um, and so just a few, oh, I've got the, uh, the boilerplate in here. So our provider statement and the learning objectives or the course description and the learning objectives. Um, so then what's what's really great about Lake Plato is the people uh, and the projects. Uh, and so the firm is full of just amazing, wonderful people that are extremely talented architects and a very competitive come Halloween for the costume design contest. Um, so we like to have a lot of fun. Uh, we're friends uh, outside of work. There's a lot of time spent together. Uh, but I think what we're really most well known for is, is buildings like this. I think the, the first uh, decade or so of Lake Plato's existence, we were doing a lot of work like this, and we still are, and I think we're, we're most well known for this. But as you'll see, uh, the particular challenge of the library is it's a, a 200,000 square foot urban building. Uh, and so trying to apply this sort of same uh, ethos and more of the, the work that I think people uh, think of when they, when they think of Lake Plato. Um, it's just a, a fabulous place to, to be with amazing folks and uh, incredible projects. Uh, so to, to really dive in, I, we, Matt and I thought an interesting way to sort of break this up would be to have the, the library uh, and really talk about the library from the inside out. And so really thinking about the, the interior um, focus of that project and then talking about Gulf Coast uh, Research Institute a little bit more from the outside in. And so here we are at the, the Austin Central Library. And just uh, the other way that I entitled this lecture is, or how I spent the last 11,000 hours of my career. This was a long, uh, big, gigantic behemoth of a project. Um, and so just a few stats um, to sort of understand the scale. So it's a 200,000 square foot, $94 million civic project. It's uh, got an amazing site in downtown Austin that is on the, the shores of Lady Bird Lake and uh, Shoal Creek. Uh, the major sort of western creek uh, on the western edge of downtown. Uh, the site was previously a, a brownfield industrial site that was a downtown electrical substation. Um, and then we set some really, it, it's a large building, it's 200,000 square feet, uh, which is double the previous facility. 
Um, and then we set some uh, big aspirational goals, uh, the biggest of which we set uh, even before we started meeting as a team. And that was we told the um, city council in Austin that it would be the best daylight library uh, in America, which definitely kept me up nights during the job. Um, and then you can see, and we'll talk a little bit later about the success of the project and just uh, how at the beginning of the project, everyone was asking me, why are we building a library? Why are we building a second homeless shelter? Why aren't we just giving every man, woman, and child a Kindle um, to why isn't it twice as big? Um, and then it's just a, a huge project also with consultants. So there's over 30 consultants on this project. We were joint ventured with Shepley Bullfinch and we were uh, very joined at the hip with the city of Austin. Um, so the team members from this project, uh, we spent nearly a decade together and got to know one, one another really well. Uh, and just a bit on the timeline. Um, so uh, the voters approved a new uh, central library in November of 2006. Um, we were awarded the project in December of 2008. And then we really um, wanted to set measurable goals early in the project before giving any sort of form for the building. So we resist our urge to grab our sketchbooks and start designing this thing. And we did several things. We did what we called the Rancherette, which was a charrette out on a ranch in West Texas with the core team from the architecture group to really between us and Shepley Bullfinch get on the, the same page with big goals. And then we brought everybody who could have a stake in the uh, integrated design uh, in. And at the same time, this was the first project in the, in the office where we actually filled out the code submission at the beginning of the project um, to set goals and really work through all of the aspirations of the project. And then the whole project went uh, towards going to those goals, which is really fun. And then CDs, library opens. Um, a lot also was happening at the same time, uh, designing a library while technology was sort of shifting under our feet and things were, were happening was, was very entertaining, uh, as well as just Austin was exploding with, with growth um, and uh, was a huge economic engine. So there's another half a million people now that are going to that library than when we kicked off the job. So those super early aspirational goals with, with Shepley were a lot about, not necessarily about traditional sustainability goals, but a lot about sort of um, social goals and technology goals. So really thinking that, that books are a technology too. In the early community meetings, Austin said they really loved their books. This isn't just sort of a genius bar. Uh, it, it has digital and analog technology. Uh, really making a space for everybody and a, a democratic hub for learning. Um, and then we're at the edge of Shoal Creek and Lady Bird Lake on an industrial brownfield site. And so really trying to take advantage of both uh, the advantages we have to the natural world and catching the breezes off the lake and having these incredible million dollar views. Uh, and then the, also this idea of encapsulating the, the urban context and creating a new Western portal to downtown. And then probably most importantly was creating a building that is both flexible for today and tomorrow. Uh, and giving something. We don't know what a library will be in 20 years, but we want to give the library a framework for them to be able to figure that out. Um, so this is something that's super important in all of our jobs is this idea of having a big integrated design workshop. And so it's really about providing guiding principles and measurable goals for the entire project. And so we get everybody in from the, any discipline that can have any impact on the sustainability of the project. And we get the client team all together. And for the library, we spent two full days breaking out into sessions and really working through some of the big goals for the project. The other big thing was we like to also do that on site. And sometimes you discover some unique opportunities on the site. And again, we're resisting the urge as architects to start drawing this thing. So we really wanna set the goals first. Uh, so a few of those. Uh, one was this idea about how the library's uh, own water cycle can function and how we can be good stewards. In Texas, we have a lot of drought. And so really working through, through that with the city. And on our, the upper left image there is our uh, job site during the Integrated Design Workshop. And we discovered uh, right outside of our future property line uh, was a 373,000 gallon unused underground cistern that used to be for the um, 
old power plant that you can see behind us there, the Seaholm power plant. And so we were able to work with the city municipality and we were able with license agreements to actually use this as essentially a free uh, rainwater collection tank uh, for the library. Um, and so here basically you can see all of the rainwater that falls on the roof, uh, scoots down here and goes across the street, which is fairly complicated, under the current downtown substation and fills up this giant tank. And then it gets pumped back to a, a small tank in the garage and is used for all of our landscape irrigation, all of our toilet flushing. Uh, and it also, we partnered with the park next door to us on uh, the creek uh, to water all of its plants, which is super exciting. And uh, then the biggest goal was really the daylight and understanding how we were going to uh, give the city of Austin the best daylight library in the country or the world, depending on uh, which presentation we, we, we did that day. Uh, and so the site is a 240 by 200 ish foot site. Um, and as most of you all know, it's, it's hard to daylight a building that's that deep. Uh, and so these were the original drawing sections from that integrated design workshop talking about how we would break the building into smaller, in this case, 60 foot wide chunks uh, so that we could get daylight on both sides. Uh, due to the programming of the library and the needs of the library, that actually became two 70 to 80 foot wide bars with a large atrium in the middle. And that just, again, came down to, to programming. You know, you needed the nonfiction to sort of wrap around in the right way. And so again, what we did for this was another workshop. Uh, we love to, to get everyone together in the same place and really work through this uh, as a team. Um, so what we did here was we did an integrated uh, daylight workshop where we had our, our daylight designer, our artificial lighting designer, our interior designer, and the architecture team. Um, and now I just wanna sort of walk through uh, how we did this so that you guys on all of your projects can, can do this. I would love to do this on every single one of my jobs. This was super helpful, not only from a daylighting perspective, but also from an architecture perspective. Um, so, you know, the, the analog process that we went through, it was like the library, both digital and analog, but the analog is we, we built a quarter inch uh, to one foot scale, what we call the dollhouse model of the atrium of the library. So we used materials that had the same colors and reflectivity of the final materials, which is something that as architects, we normally just build basswood models. And so here you can see the interior and it even had things like this giant three story tall bright red cuckoo clock that's from the art and public places that is in the eventual building. And we did that to make sure that it wasn't gonna turn all of the light in the atrium uh, pink and so really delving into that. And then we did a luminance mapping to test um, and then basically make adjustments and repeat. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about this process is we turned off different apertures using black cloth. And we, uh, so you were able to see how much efficacy the central portion of the skylight had versus the south side and the north side. Uh, and so what we did is Gus and I then went uh, the, the night between the two um, days of shreds and we rebuilt the roof uh, form to understand the, the skylight. And we made a lot of key decisions there as well as where these bridges went. It was super helpful to have a model this large where you could put your entire head in the atrium and really start to understand it. Um, so here you can see how this also really becomes Austin's uh, living room. So this idea of daylight is also reinforcing these other ideas that we had about creating a space for everybody and a democratic sort of open platform for, for learning. Um, and that didn't just stop at the daylighting shred and didn't stop at design. So this is uh, my coworker, Dan Lazarin uh, during CA and he has a light meter um, and we're at the very, very, very tippy top uh, up about a hundred feet on a platform uh, when they had just put the glass in the, the uppermost skylight. And what we're doing is checking to, to make sure, not that there's a whole lot we could do about it at that point, but that the, the daylight there was really uh, in line with what we had modeled throughout the process. Um, and the daylight really informed a lot of things on the project and throughout the submittals process and making sure that we were really checking up on the colors of things um, and the materiality and the reflectivity of things 
And so here's the, the first day where I got to the job and they had just installed the um, studs on the underside of the south portion of the skylight. And this is when I took a deep breath and thought, well, this, this crazy thing may work um, because here you can see the beautiful light quality just coming through the plastic onto the studs. The other thing that was annoying during CA about this is that the entire atrium is full of scaffolding in order to build it. And so you don't actually understand the light quality or acoustic quality until it's too late to fix it because all of the scaffolding has been taken out the front door. Um, so that was something I was not prepared for. And then here you can see that the quality of light as we're installing the acoustical plaster. So the, the dance floor um, that the contractor has over the atrium has been lowered now. Uh, Daniel and I were way up here and now it's been lowered and then they're getting ready to put the final coats of plaster on here. And again, just a lot of uh, overview and coordination to make sure that we weren't getting weird shadows and other things happening in the this, in this space. And again, the light meter. So we were able actually to take the light meter uh, in the middle of the atrium where we'd never be able to get back to unless we had a drone. And we were able to use that to actually confirm our uh, models, our digital models with the daylight uh, and the luminance mapping, which was really cool. Um, and so here you can see on the left what we showed city council we were going to give them and here I am walking up the stairs right before the furniture started going in in 2017 and you can see the, the just amazing quality of light uh, in the space and I encourage you guys all to all to visit uh, once you can once it's open again and then it gets it gets even better with people in it um, so now it's just it's this pre-COVID it was this sort of beating heart of, of Austin and this great interior space for the city. And again, you can see the Christian Muller's art piece did not in fact turn the whole atrium pink, which was great. Uh, and a lot of the other things that we were, we were doing uh, in the space to really bounce that light around. And uh, just more images uh, of, of the, the finished space so you can get a sense since we can't unfortunately all take a tour of it today. Um, but during the, the daylighting charrette, we changed several big big things. Uh, one was the, the color of the handrails went to a, a white inner layer to further bounce light around. Uh, and then we really understood the south facing walls here. Originally, the library wanted them to be green walls. Uh, but we understood when we put our green piece of felt in there that it sucked up all the daylight. So those ended up being these bright white, basically light reflectors to bounce the light down uh, the six floors. And then the bridges are placed so that they're not self shading one another. And the lights under the bridges are really about creating uh, so that you don't get a perceived dark spot under the bridges. A lot of daylight is strangely like actually in your brain. Uh, and so the, the perception of going from a really bright outdoor space into a building, oftentimes it feels darker. So we actually built the vestibules in the library are super dark. Uh, or darker. And so that way your, your eyes adjust to, you're not really competing with the sun. You go from sun to a darker space and then into that atrium, which is brighter than the space you just came out of. Um, and then on all of our jobs, we really like to go back and um, do post occupancy, do interviews with folks. Um, and here's where we ended up on the library. So those original goals of being the best daylight library in the country, we had eventually set that to mean that regularly occupied spaces in this 200,000 square foot building, more than 75% of them would be, would be daylit. Uh, we managed to beat that goal. Um, our energy reduction was huge. That's a whole nother lecture. The potable water, as we talked about, was huge with that ability to reuse that cistern. And then we've got the recycled materials. And then the thing I'm most proud of really is that the building has become so well loved. Uh, we have a 300% increase in visitors. It's twice as big as the previous library, but we have a 50% reduction in misconduct and a, a, a different mix of population using this building, uh, which has been really fascinating. And now I think I will pass it over to Matt for talking more about the outside. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to the Marine Education Center uh, at the Gulf Coast, Coast Research Library. And um, this project, um, if you move on to the next slide, was spurred on by uh, really a, a, an understanding uh, starting with uh, the eco region, starting with the landscape. Uh, I give a talk about this 
uh, project uh, often, and really the title of it uh, that I say is listening to the land, because we could not have created a building that respond, that is responsive uh, without first um, digging in deeply about the landscapes that it's in. So understanding that the coastal, that the Gulf Coast is not just one uh, ecoregion, it's multiple. Um, and uh, where the Marine Education Center is located is right in the middle of, of, of this transition between the outer coastal plain and the Florida Peninsula. Um, and then in the next uh, slide, zooming into the, uh, the, the perspective, there are uh, many ecotones um, or habitats that exist. Um, and uh, right on our site, we have uh, five of the six. And so uh, early on, we knew that we wanted to highlight and work with uh, these ecotones. Um, so a little bit about the um, history of, of this project um, uh, moving forward um, is, um, is the reason it exists. And so, um, the reason it exists is because of Hurricane Katrina. And so this is a graph of the Gulf Coast, which uh, with showing all of the um, hurricanes. And we did this study uh, from 2000 to 2018. And what's interesting, just a, a detail, is that the width of it uh, tells the story of the strength during the path of the storm. Um, so while we were uh, uh, under construction, which I'll show you later, it was hit by another hurricane, Hurricane Nate. Um, and, um, and so multiple, multiple hurricanes here. Um, but Katrina was really uh, the one that, that, that set this into motion. And on the next slide, you'll see the old facility um, that they lived in, which was right on the uh, uh, Biloxi, right on, the, right on the coast there. And it was only four feet above sea level. It was this old aquarium um, that was really given to them. And so, it, for this new spot, we knew we had to choose a, a higher ground. And so uh, on the next slide, you'll see that the, the higher ground is really located uh, just to the east um, in Ocean Springs. And the, uh, here is a, a pretty crazy photograph. This is um, a light tower just west in Biloxi um, that was the highest uh, watermark um, um, from any hurricane. It was 34 feet. Um, and the only reason we know that is because it was still standing. So this is the previous site uh, in Biloxi. This is actually right now. You can see the building there in the bottom left with it damaged. There were no trees to buffer the wind on the site and also uh, four feet above sea level. And then another picture on the next slide is the, uh, is the, is the, the building as it was. And then um, moving forward, the next, uh, the next image is what happened uh, during Katrina. And interestingly enough, a lot of, the, of this destruction did not occur from uh, the wind. Um, it occurred from debris washing in and then really destroying it when the tides moved out. And so um, they found some of their, their vans uh, uh, a mile or two away. Um, and so moving forward here, what we first started doing as with any uh, uh, project um, is then um, understanding the site. This new site that they owned uh, is actually, we're starting great, we're in a great spot. We're 19 feet above sea level at its highest point. So moving in here. Um, so the, so we always start with the integrated design charrette, much like the uh, Jonathan's project in Austin Central Library, where we, we zoom into uh, these really, really important features of the site and water and, and site ecology, along with resiliency, were, were the one, two that really this project was needing to be addressed and uh, in, challenging, in challenging ways. Um, so this was us on site. Um, this was back in about 2011. So Hurricane Katrina, 2005, um, it took six years to receive funding. Um, what's amazing about this project is that it was, uh, it's FEMA funded, so not a big uh, um, budget at all. And this gentleman in, in the front, I always show him first, is, is, this is a coastal ecologist, uh, Larry Lewis, uh, one of the smartest folks uh, we had on the team. Uh, we spent three to four months with him understanding the landscapes and listening to him uh, before we ever started drawing a line on the side. 
Um, and then moving forward here. Um, so what Larry taught us is uh, um, how to look at the land. And in this, in, in this integrated design charrette, this quote on the right was done by the director. And while we were talking about the design, he said, look, he just kind of one day kind of threw up his hands and said, all buildings eventually end up in the ocean. That's just how it is. I've seen it over the years. And so uh, I want you to think that way, to think that this, this building will be, will be destroyed one day and the materials will be floating around in the ocean. So we better have materials that are okay to be floating around the ocean. So we, we created uh, this red list along with our associate architect on abridged architecture um, in which we, 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 we pinpointed materials uh, that would not be harmful. Uh, we then of course looked at the vernacular, understanding uh, what buildings existed prior to having any mechanical systems. We realized that a lot of the roofs, roofs were very, very steep. Um, and that was used to, to shed the over 65 inches of rain a year it gets. And so this was a main inspiration to these two buildings. And then um, moving forward, um, kind of took that, took those philosophies and then started applying it to uh, the land itself. So on the next slide, uh, what we'll see is um, some other inspiration here. Faye Jones, of course, um, being one. Okay. And so here's the site itself. Um, and so uh, on the right side is Davis Bayou. Just off the page on the south is the Gulf of Mexico. So being a marine education center, we knew we, ne we needed to have close proximity to the water, but how do you create a site um, that is resilient with having that, uh, that close connection um, to the water. So what we did, if you go to the next slide, um, is zoom in on, on an area of this land that we felt like uh, was the best to achieve those, those two things. And so um, going back, if, if we go, uh, sorry, if we move forward on the slide, but if we go back to talking about Larry Lewis, the coastal ecologist, we walked the site with him um, and and, um, and on the next slide, yeah, you see that uh, there's this forested bay head, which is right in the middle. Um, that is the most sensitive part. That's where the water filters off the highland um, and into uh, the, the forested bay head, into the tidal marshes. It basically cleans the water prior to going into the bayou. So we knew we needed to stay away from that. We also, on the next slide, uh, highlighted which trees um, uh, the build zone. So, so understanding where the floodplain was. The floodplain was at 16 feet at the time, but we all know that floodplains, that was the 100-year floodplains, they don't uh, recede, they always advance. And so we said, look, we want to build within the 500-year floodplain. And so that was 18 feet. Um, and then understanding what the, where the highest elevation was. But not only did we build at 18 feet, we also uh, went two and a half feet above that. We then um, took these soil samplings with Larry Lewis, an ecologist, to understand um, the soils and where to build and where not to build. Uh, also, uh, understanding the trees. And so moving to the next slide, uh, and the next one after this, uh, these were the trees that were within the build zone um, that were either invasive, non-native, or at the end of their life cycle. So basically, trees that could not withstand high winds. Um, and so we said, well, if, if they're not, not long for this world, what if this pattern in the landscape was the pattern where our buildings then lived? And so in the next slide, you'll see we fit our buildings into this. Uh, and by doing this, it allowed the strongest trees with the greatest capacity to buffer wind uh, to be our uh, defense uh, for, for storms. And so uh, moving on to the next slide, um, and the next after this, you'll see um, on day one, um, and this is just a zoom in, and the next one, you'll see that this is what it looked like uh, in the opening. We can see how close the trees were. I think as architects, many, uh, many, many people make the assumption that to have a resilient building, you must make the, the building strong and resilient itself. I think if you start with the landscape, if you start with listening to the land and understanding that, you can have the land do the work for you, um, which is really important. And then the next slide just shows sort of a, 
a transect, a site transect of, of just what we're dealing with. On the, on the left side are uh, laboratories and classrooms. We then spanned this, this sensitive coastal uh, forested bayhead with a 200 foot long uh, cable suspension bridge. Um, and then on the east side is really the main campus, uh, which is the exhibits, uh, offices, flexible use space, and then an um, overlook pavilion onto the bayou itself. Having this configuration um, allows the facility to then close the west side uh, when it's not in use. So they have a lot of summer camps. And, and so in the winter, they're only really on the eastern side, which really saves up energy, electricity use. And then um, what we also uh, thought about in this design too is understanding that circulation between buildings was an educational moment. And so circulating and understanding these five of the six ecotones of, uh, of the bay was really important from the pine forest on the west over this forested bayhead onto the main campus, uh, which is the pine forest uh, and then the tidal marshes of the bayou. So um, the next slide here, we'll just go into some of these spaces. On the east side, again, uh, you have exhibit space that you first come up into. Uh, administration for the south, which is the most private um, um, an event space on the north, um, which is great because um, that space uh, now allows for like-minded organizations like the, the Sierra Club to, to use. Um, and so they've been getting a lot of uh, folks uh, on campus for that. And then the Overlook Pavilion on, on the east uh, and then on the west, um, the classrooms and labs. And so I just show, wanted to show you some of the evolution of this, of this project, along with what uh, Jonathan was showing. Uh, we start with analog, uh, and in this case, we start with drawing, with sketching. And so this was one of the first sketches of the uh, entry sequence um, to the buildings. And so this, was, this next uh, uh, rendering is during schematic design. You can see the bridge in the background. At the time, the bridge kind of resembled Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, we made it. Uh, asymmetrical and only had one um, touch point again to to only to span the bay head um, and then the next uh, image is uh, during design development kind of the um, rendering uh, revit phase uh, where we're zeroing in on the proportions a little bit more um, you can see the bridge on the right became asymmetrical so you don't have a uh, structure within the bay head and then the final uh, image of the uh, built, uh, completed work um, here. So, um, and then moving on, we'll just show you a couple, uh, a couple more images um, before uh, coming into, moving into the systems of the, of the building itself. So this is as you move in to the building, um, a first sketch of how that would look like. We knew we wanted to work with uh, standard two by materials so that if it were damaged within a storm, that you can easily pick these up at any Home Depot or any lumber yard. Uh, this is all Southern Yellow Pine, so readily available. Uh, we did not go above uh, two by tens. So if you move on um, to the next one, I think there's a uh, reflected ceiling plan here, which shows you the extent of the, oh, this is, yeah, this is the construction here. Um, you can see on the right side, that's the opening to where the bridge uh, is spanning across to that uh, western side over, over the bayhead. There were some, many mistakes uh, made during construction, which uh, I'll, I'll point out, uh, especially with this bridge a little later. And then the next slide here. Um, so this was hurricane uh, zone, and so the, the strategies that we um, wanted, of course, 65 inches of rain annually. We wanted to lift the building to allow for that water to drain underneath. Uh, some went to a cistern uh, that flushed, uh, that was used for uh, gray water, uh, black water reuse. Uh, but then we, um, we did not want to capture all of the rain because it was really important um, for it to go into the bayhead and filter into the uh, bayou itself. Uh, solar hot water uh, for the restrooms. Um, and then this was the, uh, this is the RCP, so the reflected ceiling plan. So uh, look at how many, how, they, uh, how many ties you need, um, cross bracing, um, just to withstand 185 uh, 
mount and outer lens. And then moving on, um, understanding this is this this is my favorite photograph of, that we have of the project, and this was not a staged uh, image at all. This was uh, during their summer camps, and this is the path that uh, students get, summer campers get uh, from the labs on the west to the forested bayhead, and understanding all the ecotones along the way. And then moving. On to the next slide here. Um, so a view, if you can see the top right, uh, there's a little dot with the arrows showing the view initially of, from the bayou of this overlook. Um, the one lesson learned here is uh, on the next, uh, the next is an is a image um, rendering of, of this, a little different perspective. But what's funny is during our during our project, uh, they 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 got a uh, uh, this boat, the Miss PCB, uh, and Miss PCB uh, was given to them by Jimmy Buffett, and so they said we got to have this rendering of the of the Bayou, but we have to have Jimmy Buffett's boat in there because we want to send it to him as a thank you. So um, just a funny side note. And then this uh, actually is the is the built photograph. And one thing I want to zero in on is. It's really kind of hard to see, but there's this concrete pier that looks very, very long. Um, that's in your in the in, in the front of it. Uh, we used a lesson learned to us is that the survey that they provided uh, was done in 2002. By the time this was built, um, they poured the concrete, and by the time this was built, 17 years later, the side of the bank had eroded. And had we really uh, keyed that together, we would have moved it back. So there was a lot of stabilization uh, of this. Of course, that, that survey was pre-Katrina, so most likely a lot of the erosion occurred because of that. So just a lesson learned on, on pushing your client um, to get new surveys. They did not have any money, and FEMA would not pay for new surveys, so we were kind of left with what we had. Okay, and then moving to the next. And so, there's, I think the next image is a courtyard space of the buildings itself, looking back at the bridge. Yeah, so from this perspective, um, and really understanding that education um, doesn't just occur inside the building, it occurs by the spaces uh, between. And so we really wanted to create a space that uh, for larger lectures, but also smaller uh, gatherings. So this is their their, their summer camp group uh, within the space itself. With, in the background, you can see the, the bridge um, across to the west side. So the bridge was really interesting. Um, they did not have a bridge in their last facility and FEMA will not pay for anything um, you didn't have before. So a bridge was not in that scope. We uh, argued that it was for horizontal egress uh, away from the building, uh, plus that uh, building on the west side one uh, could not move left uh, from east to west uh, per ADA uh, in a fashion. So we argued this, they said, okay, fine, you can have this, but we're not gonna pay for any design services for it. And so what we did is um, we flew out and met with uh, bridge builders in uh, Seattle, Seattle Bridge, um, um, and they had done some incredible bridges out there and they really uh, helicopter in remote sites and do it all by hand. And so. Uh, very, very sensitive. They don't take big mas machinery or any machinery out when they build it. And uh, we work with them and we drew some schematics and then they wrote a performance spec. Uh, so this was built based off a of performance spec uh, with these drawings, uh, quote unquote, for reference. And then the next, uh, so the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the, the bridge itself. Uh, a lesson learned on the west side was uh, the contractors put a silk fence around it. Uh, which was great. We asked for a silt fence around the entire job site, but they didn't realize that uh, the silt fence was perpendicular to the path of travel for this uh, water to flow into the uh, into the tidal marshes in the bayou. So we were actually um, hurting the the land. Um, another another lesson learned was that they came and cleared the site all at once, but the bridge wasn't built for three years, and so it exposed the silt and really caused it a, a drainage down. So. Um, I would work with your contractors in the future to phase um, some of the site clearings. Uh, if we, had we known this would take so long to build. And then I think there's just a few more slides here. 
uh, the, over on the west side, uh, just views early on um, of these classrooms, understanding we wanted uh, um, them to face each other, have outdoor porches uh, that then um, connected to the space in between for learning, and then this uh, bridge in the background. And then um, the final uh, product. Thanks so much. We'd love to get some questions about the library and and um, pass it back to, to Gina and Lauren. Thank you guys so much. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or um, you should have the ability to unmute yourself um, if you'd like to do that and um, open it up for questions. Anybody? Jonathan, Jonathan, can you can you um, kind of elaborate a little bit lessons learned relative to the effort to get daylighting into a what you know a program requires a deeper floor plate, how how that was accomplished? Sure. So uh, the the key thing I think early was um, and partially I think our program being a library really helped us. Um, was the uh, the fact that the the owner just got super excited about being the best daylight library in the country, and so I think that that was key to helping us. Um, and then they they bought into this idea of breaking the building sort of in two chunks. With uh, early on, it was either an outdoor courtyard or an atrium space in the middle, and so we we went back and forth a lot on that. But I think once they saw all those initial renderings of the atrium and they started seeing the, the dollhouse from the, the daylight uh, model, they just got real excited. I mean, anytime a client can sort of stick their entire head into a model and see the, see the future, I think they start to, start to understand the, the power of that, that design. Um, and then the contractor also eventually um, bought into to what we were trying to do. I mean, those metal panels that go six stories that are really reflecting all the light, there was a whole nother talk I could give on lessons learned about the dangers of touch up paint when your contractor touches those up before all the scaffolding comes out and then they start taking the scaffolding out and you see every little piece of touch up they did. Uh, so that sub actually went uh, and repainted all of those panels in situ so that they would have this nice uh, reflective appearance and not have these uh, sort of zebra spots on them. Um, so yeah, I think it was getting them in it, on board early and then really just figuring out a way to, to mask the building and to tune that skylight uh, to get the light to do what we needed it to do. Got a follow-up question um, on the the skylight. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kind of the glass and if there's any frit and how you actually determined um, that material to get the best quality of light and kind of maintain heat gain and, and that sort of thing. Sure. So the the skylight is uh, shaped like a, a big W or a cowboy hat. And so the, the center of the cowboy hat um, has a, an interlayer in the glass. It doesn't have a frit. It has an Arctic white interlayer okay. uh, between the, the two layers of, of glass. And the handrails also have the same Arctic white interlayer. And that's to give you a nice diffuse sense of light from the center. And then the north and south facing skylights are the same uh, solar band 70 XL Starfire clear glass. But on the south, we actually do have um, glass light shelves on the south that are cutting down on the glare. Uh, and a lot of that again went back to the, that came out of the digital modeling. And there are a, a few times of the year when the sun is super low, where the sun does get under those glass shelves. And so you do have one or two days a year where the atrium is more artful than normal and a little more glary. But for the, you know, 98% of the year, those really help. Great, thank you. I see there's a, a question, um, a couple questions here. 
Uh, one was the division of labor between uh, the joint uh, architecture firms. And I'll speak first and have Jonathan speak to the library. Um, so we, on the Marine Education Center, we were the design architect and the architect of record. And so we, we had an associate architect unabridged architecture that really were the boots on the ground. Um, during, during CA, they were there every two weeks. We were there once a month, so they filled in that. They were uh, provided local knowledge. They, uh, they live on the coast in Bay St. Louis. Um, their house, uh, which was just built a year before Katrina, was the only one that survived in the neighborhood. Um, so they had a lot of understanding uh, about coastal resiliency and also kind of pointed us in the right direction to speak to contractors about detailing and, and, and just understanding environment in more detail. And on the, the library with Shepley Bullfinch, uh, we were uh, a, a joint venture. So we formed a joint venture and we were um, always uh, involved in e each other's phases. So Shepley having done, you know, uh, over a hundred libraries in their 150 years of uh, doing uh, public work um, led during programming, but we were still involved in all of those public meetings. Um, we led during concept SD and then around 50% DD. We officially transitioned the model at that time before BIM 360, the model actually, you know, went up from San Antonio to Boston and we would remote into their, their model. And during concept and SD and part of DD, we actually had someone from their Boston office working in San Antonio in our office. And they led during DD and CDs with us still in the model detailing certain pieces. And then during CA due to our uh, geographically being so much closer, um, we got to, to lead uh, through CA and post occupancy. And so that one was really, we were all uh, tangled up in it together, uh, which I thought was, was hugely beneficial. And then there's another one here about, could you speak further about the integrated design charrette or workshop for your firm? And there was another question about how long we typically d dedicate to those. So I'll just talk sort of on my projects. I think it's probably fairly similar to what, what Matt's doing, but um, typically um, like for the library or for I'm doing a project right now in New Orleans, uh, typically we allot two days and we try and get everyone in the room for as, as much time as possible. My New Orleans, client was a little bit unsure about an integrated design workshop and um, thought we were all just going to be singing kumbaya around a campfire. Uh, but they actually ended up staying for the full two days and talked about how great it was to get on the same page early. Uh, and so for us, it's not just about these aspirational high performance goals. It's really about um, getting ideas, good ideas on the table early and seeing which ones stick and which ones people are excited about. And it actually has great impacts and makes decisions uh, easier to make down the line, right? If we didn't all know that the Austin Central Library was going to be about hugely about daylight, then later on during submittals and other things, it would it could create a thornier or harder decision making process. And then I think being on site is hugely beneficial. Matt, you got. So uh, as far as the Eco Conservation Studio, um, the integrated design charts are really interesting because of two things. Um, number one, a lot of the clients we have are nonprofits. And nonprofits do not have, um, have, have really small budgets. Um, and so we uh, work our integrated design charrette in with them more as a kickoff, uh, mostly uh, like, like you would any project, and then kind of weave it in uh, the schedule that way. Um, for the Marine Education Center, we knew that we had to really focus on understanding the land um, and the constraints of that um, uh, much more than the average uh, project. So we spent three or four months doing that. It was an additional service from basic services, um, but we were able to raise, uh, they were able to raise funds uh, just with that, um, with the understanding of how important it was. Um, and so it's typically, I, I mean, for us, you know, I'd say at least a month, month and a half long. Um, there's so much on the front end of it because you have to <clears throat> invite all the stakeholders. Sometimes there's 30 or 40 people there. Uh, we divide the stakeholders into uh, groups uh, that are dedicated to you know either air or land, land or energy or, and so, um, and then we have them do a little bit of homework before they show up. Uh, and so there's a lot of front ending before we even get to the workshop uh, that needs to happen. 
Yeah, there's a lot of homework. So the, the idea is that we're bringing precedents and ideas um, to that workshop. Um, the mechanical engineer has already been, you know, tasked with, you know, bringing ideas. Uh, and so everyone already has sort of uh, little uh, book reports, if you will, on their area of expertise to sort of seed that uh, workshop to make it as successful as possible. And then we afterwards write a big report uh, that really has those big goals. And again, some of these projects are smaller and it's just a, a one page, here are the goals we all set. And I've even had clients that said, we don't, we don't care, why don't you set the goals for me and we'll do an internal one and then submit that and get those goals. But I found that it's really nice to get people excited about those goals rather than rating systems. So in, in Austin, we, were, uh, we had to be lead silver per city code. But once we had set these big aspirational goals, we were well beyond lead platinum um, within our budget and everyone at the city just got super excited about it. So uh, Austin is the first lead platinum project in the city's portfolio. Um, somebody else asked from a schedule perspective, does the no sketchbook charrette happen pre-program or concurrent with programming? And then how long is typical pre-design investigation? I think um, I like to have that integrated design workshop as early as possible, but I'd like on a public job to do it near the tail end or after the community input phase. Um, and you need to have, I think it's best to have some idea of programming, but sometimes the workshop influences the programming. Um, so it's, it can be a little bit nebulous. I think it depends on a, a project by project. And then the pre-design investigation of a site and sort of this integrated design process, I think is normally a month to six-ish weeks, I think uh, is sort of normally where we, where we go for that. Um, and then do you have specialty divisions in your firm? Um, you mentioned a lighting designer, energy modeler. Um, so we tend to work with really amazing consultants and most of those are, are outside of the firm. Uh, we have folks in our sustainability uh, group that are integrated. I forget, we just renamed it. It's got some more awesome name now. Design. What are you calling it? Design performance? Is that Design. what it's called? Yeah. Uh, so within that group that have back, a more diverse set of backgrounds. So one's a mechanical engineer um, and they're able to uh, talk mechanical engineering and speak the mechanical engineer's language when we have uh, issues. Uh, but Typically, we're just looking to partner with people with great local knowledge or fantastic national uh, engineers that can really help push us and our clients to, to make as aspirational a project as possible. And we do, we do a member of our team, uh, on each team of our projects, sustainability champion. And so if it's, it's to um, you know, meet and report back and, and, and push. And um, so we have at least one person on every project uh, that's in charge of that. And Matt, someone asked about the red list on the uh, Marine Center. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, some of the Marine, uh, the red list is really interesting. Um, so there's a conundrum with, with, with many, many things. Um, one is plumbing. And so uh, there's really no, a lot of this is the lesser of two evils we had to choose from. So for instance, in plumbing, uh, there's either copper or PVC. Well, uh, copper uh, leaches, if it's buried underground, it leaches into uh, the environment very, very bad uh, for marine environments and for water and for forested bay heads. Uh, but, then, but then plastics and, and PVC, if they break away and end up in the ocean, um, it's very, very bad for marine life. And so uh, we worked for a hybrid to where uh, we had the PVC up into um, uh, underground because so the PVC would not leach into the soils being underground. Uh, but then above uh, uh, copper, and uh, we spoke to the director who's sitting in the middle of the, of the, the building right there, and he said, "Look, if there's a if there's a, a hurricane and the whole building gets washed out to sea, uh, the last of our worries would be copper floating around there. It would be PVC. So um, uh, as those 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 conversations are are super super interesting uh, to have. Um, uh, pressure treated wood. So we tried to minimize pressure treated wood. We got rid of all pressure treated wood." everywhere save for um, the, the beams directly underneath uh, in contact with, with uh, right above the ground. Um, so we had um, uh, typical wood non-pressure treated and then found um, 
um, some stains um, to use them. I, I, I have the name. It's been it's been a few years, so I can't I can't remember. But we spent um, we spent uh, years trying to find uh, a good example, and also uh, um, put together these stains and put them out on site for a year uh, just just to see how they would hold up. Um, um, and then lastly, we also uh, for this for all the steel understood uh, the differences between stainless, galvanized, um, and, and and chose in the end chose to galvanize there and had had a specialty uh, consultant working on that for a few months, um, um, just looking into sort of materials. And then uh, Ken asked about elaborating on the coat top ten experience. I think. Just at our office, um, that is kind of the, the award that everyone wants their project to win. And so there's sort of almost competition within the office to, to try and uh, nab those. And so um, I, I like for all of my projects to think through that lens as early as possible. Uh, so like on the library, I try and fill out uh, basically the, the coat top 10 before there's even a building. The, the submission for you know all the different parts about you know design with community and designing with ecology and um, I find that just really helpful in sort of weaving together the early narratives that we want um, in the design um, and then you can go back and uh, look and see the uh, the library's you know fake uh, 2012 submission and compare it to the one from 2020. And in that case, it was it was surprisingly close, which is uh, what you want in your wildest dreams as an architect. So, for for us, um, we took a little different approach. Um, about ten years ago, we were realizing we were kind of stuck in this checklist mentality um, with lead, and kind of made a made an effort just to throw that checklist out the window and say, what does this project really really need? And whether it checks a box or doesn't. Uh, it's most important to understand it from that perspective. And so uh, for this project, when we started, LEED was, um, was uh, accepted in, in, in Mississippi. And by accepted, I mean uh, paid for services, LEED services paid for by the state. Um, it became illegal. Um, it was outlawed um, a year or two in. So we were tracking um, LEED, LEED Platinum on this before it was thrown out. So they wouldn't, they defunded um, all of that uh, based on the under the, really the rationale there was they said that uh, lead projects were taking um, work out of state. Um, and so um, having that non-checklist uh, mentality really just allows you to, to do what's, what's right uh, for the building. And in this case, we don't have any third party uh, uh, certifications on here because uh, we couldn't have them. Yeah, but I think even if even if you're going for lead, like thinking about this aspirationally and getting your client to dream with you early about what's important to them and the project is way more a, a way easier way to get your foot in the sustainability door than talking about bike racks and showers at that first meeting. I mean, yeah. it's it's really huge. And we like to do that on all of our jobs. And I, I see it again and again with clients that I don't think will get inspired. Um, they, they find something during that integrated design workshop that uh, they latch on to for the rest of the job. Most importantly, too, it, it, that the document that comes out of the integrated design shred allows for a compass uh, to point to when you are uh, in the VE stage of saying, hey, remember when this, remember this, this was a most important feature. So why are we thinking about, let's think of other uh, uh, value engineering uh, uh, opportunities rather than, you know, X, Y, or Z that will affect our, what we all collectively agreed to do. Well, it, it looks like you've answered most of our, our questions. So I just want to take this time and thank you, Matt and Jonathan, um, for spending time with our chapter this morning. I know I'm not the only one who will be going about the rest of the day, feeling inspired, ready to take on the next project. So thank you for that. Um, and this concludes the presentation. Great. Thank you all for, for having us. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to email us. Our uh, emails can be found on the Lake Flato website. Thank you. Thank you.